um, let us continue with what we are trying to do. So, you know we are trying to prove uh, uh, the, the final aim is to uh, prove the uh, Picard's theorems okay and the little Picard theorem uh, will be deduced as a corollary of the great Picard theorem okay and, uh, and the, but the great Picard theorem, the little Picard theorem is about uh, uh, the image of an entire function. The great Picard theorem is about the image of a deleted neighborhood of an isolated essential singularity okay and uh, what we are going to now uh, first prove which is the easiest thing to prove to begin with uh, to give to get you a feel of things is the Cassorati Weierstrass theorem which says that uh, if you take any neighborhood of uh, an isolated essential singularity the image of that neighborhood of course uh, with the singularity omitted of course. Uh, the image of that uh, neighborhood will always be a dense subset of the complex plane okay namely its it, its closure will be the whole complex plane okay what this is what this means is that uh, take any complex number you can always find a sequence of points in any neighborhood of an isolated essential singularity such that the function values at those points approaches that complex number okay so let me write that down let's prove it the key to proving the Cassorati Weierstrass theorem is the uh, is the Riemann removable singularity theorem which we which, which we proved last time okay so let me write that down mm. so uh, uh, Cassorati uh, Weierstrass theorem So, uh, let uh, Z not be an isolated uh, essential singularity of uh, the analytic function f of Z. Uh, given uh, any complex number W naught, we can find a sequence of points Uh, in a neighborhood of Z naught such that uh, if you take the function values at those points F Z n that tends to W naught okay. So, this is the uh, uh, this is the Cassorati Westwest here okay. You take an isolated essential singularity z naught of an analytic function f of z and uh, then you can always find a sequence of points in a neighborhood of z naught such that the function values at those points uh, tends to uh, the limit w naught okay. So, in this way uh, so what your uh, what does this mean it means see uh, uh, w naught can be uh, f of z n tends to w naught means that you can uh, no matter how close you go to W naught you can find function values okay. So, that means that W naught is in the uh, closure of the set of function values that is what it means. So, W naught is a limit point of the image set of f okay the image set of f is just a set of values of f okay and uh, what this says is that every complex number is in the closure of the image set the set of values that f takes okay and uh, this is uh, this is a very deep theorem because what it says is that uh, it tells you that therefore the Im if you take the image of a deleted neighborhood of the isolated essential singularity then the image is going to be huge because a set which is tense is huge okay 
uh, the image is going to be dense in the complex plane. So that means the image closure is the whole complex plane. So it's the image is huge, and uh, this is the this is kind of uh, much weaker when compared to the uh, statement of the Great Picard theorem, which says that the image is actually the whole complex plane, or at most a punctured plane. Namely, it can at most omit a point. Okay, but you must remember that that omitted point is also in the closure because it can be approached by other points. Okay, so uh, so this casualty wave stress theorem is a uh, uh, weaker version of uh, you know uh, the Great Picard theorem, uh, but it tells you uh, it answers this question that we have been uh, worried about, namely what is the image of uh, uh, an analytic function. Okay, so. Uh, so let us prove this, the proof of this is just going to involve, uh, 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 it is just going to involve uh, Riemann's removal singularity theorem, okay, the use of Riemann's removal singularity theorem. So, uh, so let me, so let me write this uh, uh, also, uh, in other words, uh, 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 the, the image of F is dense in the complex plane. Okay, this is another way of saying it. Okay, uh, so so let's go on to the uh, the proof of the theorem. So uh, you know, uh, so you know the uh, the idea of the proof is very very simple. What you do in the proof is that you uh, uh, you prove by contradiction. Okay, so you assume that there is a complex value which is not in the uh, uh, closure of the image. That means there is a complex value uh, which is not in the limit of values in the image. Okay? That means that the image uh, is bounded away from a certain complex value. Okay? You assume that and then you show that if this is the case, then your function cannot have an isolated essential, essential singularity at z0, but the singularity has to either be removable or it has to be a pole. And this is where you will be using uh, Riemann's removable singularity theorem. So this is the technique of the proof. The technique of the proof is just by contradiction. Okay, uh, you you assume that a certain value is not in the limit, okay, and then you show that this will imply that either z not is a removable singularity or it is a pole, and both of these are not possible. They will give contradictions because you, you have assumed that z not is an essential singularity, which by definition is something that is neither a removable singularity nor a pole. Okay, so that is how the proof works. So let me write down the proof. So, uh, so proof, so let me go to a different color. Uh, 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 proof uh, by contradiction. Assume uh, that there exists a W naught uh, complex value such that uh, uh, such that the the conclusion of the theorem does not hold. So you assume this. Okay, the conclusion of the theorem is that given any complex value W naught. Okay, you can find a sequence of points z n uh, such that the function values at z n approaches w naught. Now you assume that that's not the case. Assume that there is at least one w naught for which this doesn't happen. Okay, and we'll try to get a contradiction. So, uh, so what does this mean? What it means is that uh, it means that w naught cannot be approached by image points. Okay. This the other way of uh, saying this is that you are trying to say that there is a neighborhood of W naught, okay, which has nothing to do with the image, okay, which doesn't intersect the image. So that means that there is an epsilon greater than zero, such that this open disk centered at W naught radius epsilon is disjoint from the image of F, okay. That's the uh, that's what it means, okay. So so let me write that down. So uh, thus. There exists uh, epsilon greater than zero, such that uh, uh, mod w minus w w naught less than epsilon does not 
meet the image of f. Image of f i m f is just the set of values of f and the set of values of f uh, includes all values that f takes in a uh, 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 also in uh, the deleted neighborhood of uh, the isolated singularity set norm okay, which we have assumed is essential. Okay, so, so, what does, so, what does this mean? So, how do, uh, so what do I do now? Now, you see, uh, uh, so, so let us rewrite that. Thus, uh, for all uh, z, not equal to z, not of course, okay, we have uh, mod uh, f of z minus w0 uh, is greater than or equal to epsilon. This is what it means. So, uh, so let me again uh, tell you what I wrote down uh, before. What I wrote down before is that the disk uh, uh, centered at W naught radius epsilon does not meet the image. Okay, it means that there is no point in the image whose distance from W naught is less than epsilon. So it means that uh, uh, if you take any point in the image, the distance from that point uh, to W naught is at least epsilon. Or greater than epsilon, and that's what I've written down. So when you write mod f, when I write mod f z minus w naught is greater than or equal to epsilon, I'm actually saying that the distance between uh, f of z, which is the uh, point in the image of f, uh, the value of f at z, and w naught, is at least epsilon. Okay. Now, uh, so you know uh, the uh, the advantage with having this kind of a thing is that see whenever you have a function. Uh, uh, which is bounded away from 0. Okay. The, uh, what is the advantage of having a function bounded away from 0? The advantage of having a function bounded away from 0 is that you can invert it. Okay. You, it is reciprocal makes sense. Okay. So here fz minus w0 mind you is also a function. Okay. f of z is a function. fz minus w0 is just the function f of z added to the constant minus w0 and uh, adding this does not change the analyticity of the function except at the point z0 where which of course we are not going to worry about okay uh, mind you when i when i write f of z i am of course assuming z is in the domain of analyticity of f okay it's it's uh, uh, it's implicit and of course z is not z not because z not is not a point where f is analytic to begin with i i have assumed that z not is a an essential singularity it's a singular point okay so uh, so the point is that since i have mod f minus w not is greater than or epsilon 1 by mod f 1 by f minus w not makes sense as a function okay so uh, and what it tells you is that that function in a, in a in a in a deleted neighborhood of z not is bounded by 1 by epsilon okay that's what it says so now now uh, uh, look at uh, g of z uh, defined to be 1 by f of z minus w not okay uh, in uh, 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 in uh, a deleted neighborhood of uh, z0 okay now look at this function now uh, you see this function uh, mod gz is greater than or equal to is less than or equal to 1 by epsilon you have that that's just inverting uh, mod fz minus w0 greater than or equal to epsilon uh, so what you have is now you have two things. Uh, see, uh, g of z uh, makes sense uh, as a an analytic function. Okay, uh, it's because it is a reciprocal of an analytic function, and it is defined where the uh, uh, denominator does not vanish. Okay, so f z minus w not never vanishes because uh, if it vanishes, then its modulus uh, uh, will be zero and vice versa. But the modulus is always bounded away from zero. It's it's always greater than or equal to epsilon. So f z minus w not never vanishes. Okay, and mind you, wherever f is analytic, f z minus w not is also analytic. Okay, because uh, it's just f of z added to the constant minus w not. Adding a constant does not change the analyticity of a function because a constant function is also analytic, and sum of analytic functions is analytic. Okay, so. Uh, f z minus w naught is also analytic in 
uh, a deleted neighborhood of Z0 okay and it is non zero so its reciprocal 1 by fz minus uh, w0 is as well analytic in a in a deleted neighborhood of z0 okay so what i have now is i have this function gz it's analytic in a deleted neighborhood of z0 okay z0 is a singular point but look at the last uh, inequality this function is bounded in a neighborhood of z0 now riemann's removable singularity theorem will tell you that z0 has to be a removable singularity for g okay so uh, uh, since uh, so let me write that down since g of z is analytic in a deleted neighborhood of z0 z0 is also a singular point of g of g and further is a removable singularity uh, by Riemann's theorem on removable singularities uh, since it is bounded. So here is where we are using the Riemann's removable singularity theorem. Okay. So what it means is that uh, uh, so it means that uh, uh, g can be redefined at z0 so that you get a function which is analytic at z0 as well. Okay. And uh, 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 and the fact that you can uh, uh, define g redefine g at z0. Okay. Uh, should tell you that uh, uh, f has to have at z0 either a removable singularity or a pole it cannot have an essential singularity that is the uh, that is the conclusion of all this and that is a contradiction to the hypothesis that uh, z0 is actually an essential singularity and that is how we get the proof of the theorem of the Cassorati Weierstrass theorem okay. So let me write that down uh, 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 thus uh, limit z tends to z0 g of z exists call it g of z0 and then g extends to an analytic function at z0 okay so this is this is what removable singularity means you can take the uh, you can so uh, so this is probably uh, the right time for me to recall the Riemann's removable singularity theorem what does it say uh, it gives you an equivalence of four statements the first statement is that the point in concern uh, the uh, the isolated singularity in concern is, is is removable okay which is equivalent to saying by definition that the function can be extended to an analytic function at that point the second condition is slightly weaker that you can extend the function continuously to that point okay namely uh, the condition is that the limit of the function as you approach that point exists okay as a finite complex number and then the third condition uh, was the condition uh, uh, equivalent condition that involved the Laurent expansion and uh, that condition was that if you write out the Laurent expansion about a removable singularity you actually get a Taylor expansion namely there are no negative powers there is there is no principal part there is no singular part okay and then the, the fourth condition which was the most amazing was the condition that the function is bounded uh, in a neighborhood of the singularity okay the bounded of course bounded means bounded in modulus okay and I told you that that is the weakest of all the four conditions and uh, that boundedness in uh, the neighbor boundedness in a neighborhood of a singularity can only happen if the singularity is a removable singularity that is essentially uh, Riemann's uh, removable singularity theorem. So, uh, so you know <coughs> the, so because of that the limit as z tends to z0 uh, g of z exists uh, let us call it as g of z0 so g extends to an analytic function at z0. So here I am using several equivalent versions of the Riemann's removable singularity theorem you must realize that 
Now, uh, the question is, uh, uh, it all depends on what uh, uh, G of, what is the, what, what the value of G of Z naught is. The point is that if G of Z naught is 0, okay, uh, 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 then uh, 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 F has a pole at Z naught, okay, and if G of Z naught is not 0, then F has a removal similarity at Z naught. Okay, and and then, then and then thus we have manifest a contradiction uh, to what we have assumed. Okay, so let me write that down. Now, uh, and now uh, if uh, g of z naught is zero, uh, we see that uh, limit e z tends to z naught f of z uh, uh, <coughs> has to be infinity. This has to happen because you know. Uh, the limit as z tends to z naught uh, g of z is 0. So, the limit as z tends to z naught 1 by f z minus w naught is 0 and that means the denominator has to become unbounded. So, that means uh, and if f z minus w naught has to become unbounded in modulus then f has because w naught is just a constant f has to become unbounded in modulus and uh, that is the condition for a pole. Okay. So, uh, so, if g of z naught is 0 then limit z tends to z naught f of z is infinity uh, and uh, z naught uh, is a pole is a pole of f uh, and you see uh, z naught is a pole of f uh, which is not possible so that's that is ruled out so we have ruled out the case that g of z naught is zero the only other case is when g of z naught is not 0 okay uh, if uh, g of z naught is not equal to 0 uh, then uh, limit uh, uh, as e z tends to z naught uh, f of uh, z is actually uh, w naught uh, uh, plus 1 by g z naught you will get this okay. Uh, which means uh, uh, again by Riemann's removable singularity theorem that f has a removable singularity at z naught. Okay. which is again not possible. So, uh, so in both cases you get a contradiction and we are done ok. So, that that is the uh, that brings you to the end of the proof ok. So, you see we are applying the uh, you must you must see that uh, we have applied the Riemann's removable singularity theorem twice. We have applied it once to G, and then we have applied it uh, in one of the cases to F itself. Okay. Uh, fine. So so this uh, so this theorem is uh, is a is a very nice theorem, uh, and uh, 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 so what it tells you is that you take a neighborhood of an isolated essential singularity, and take its image. You are going to more or less fill up the whole complex plane uh, you are going to get the image is at least dense and we have to move towards the proof of the, uh, the great Picard theorem ok. Now, um, what I am going to do next is I am going to uh, uh, deal with the point at infinity ok. So, you see uh, the uh, you see in, in this proof itself uh, for example, uh, uh, when I wrote down limit z tends to z naught f of z is infinity ok. Uh, uh, I am using the point at infinity. So, you would have seen the point at infinity as uh, the extra point that is added to get a one point compactification of the complex plane and you would also have seen it as a Riemann sphere in a first course and but anyway I want to recall these things because you see it is very important from now on to be able to uh, think of infinity both in the domain of definition of the function as well as in the range of values of the function. So, you want to have a situation where you can talk of uh, your function uh, uh, a variable an independent variable going to infinity and its value at uh, uh, for example, the value of a function at infinity you want to say that 
and you also want uh, a function to take the value infinity okay you want to include infinity into your uh, set of uh, values of the independent variable and the set of values of the dependent variable so you have to deal with infinity carefully and usually in a first course probably this is uh, sometimes not uh, covered very uh, thoroughly so I, I want to just revise these things so that you, you are comfortable about thinking about, about limits at infinity and uh, infinite limits okay so that is what I am going to do next. So um, and, and I need that because uh, 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 because of the following reason see I want to be able to think of infinity as one of the values of a function okay and I also want to be able to think of infinity as a singularity okay see for example if you take an entire function okay then the point at infinity is uh, of course approachable by uh, infinity is of course uh, uh, approachable by any uh, uh, by any curve uh, on the complex plane which is non-bounded okay. So you can always approach the point at infinity and then the question is uh, uh, whether the function is analytic at infinity or it is not analytic at infinity so in, you want to think of infinity as a singular point okay and then the question is what kind of singularity is it because you know we have already classified singularities as either removable or uh, pole or essential. So the question is I want to be able to think of uh, infinity the point at infinity as a singularity and question uh, uh, or study when this singularity is either a removable singularity or a pole or an essential singularity okay. So the point at infinity is very very important so, uh, so let me go to that uh, so I will take another color uh, uh, the point uh, the point at infinity uh, infinite limits uh, infinite values so this is what I am going to uh, I am going to tell you about okay so uh, well uh, so the uh, so the idea is as follows so what we do is let us uh, so first of all let me uh, uh, you know the approach uh, to everything is uh, since we are doing calculus the approach is always through limits so let me recall what uh, uh, a finite limit is okay as a as a way as an independent variable approaches uh, a finite value okay so you know see limit uh, so when I write limit z tends to z0 okay when I write this what does it mean for for uh, z0 in C for uh, for let z0 be a complex number okay what does limit z tends to z0 mean see it means that you are going closer and closer to the point z0 okay so uh, basically what it means is that and, and, and what does it mean to say that you are going closer and closer to z0 uh, if you think of z as a moving point a variable point then you are saying that the distance from z to z0 is becoming smaller and smaller okay. So this limit as z tends to z0 can be interpreted as limit as uh, mod z minus z0 tends to uh, 0 okay that is how you can interpret it okay. So, uh, uh, so this uh, uh, means so let me write that here uh, means uh, mod z minus z0 tends to 0 okay uh, 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 means we let let so let me write that we are, we are letting mod z minus z0 tend to 0 and mod z minus z0 mind you is the distance between z and z0 and uh, what it means is that if you go to definitions what is the business of uh, letting uh, something go to 0 uh, in analysis trying to let something go to 0 is the same as making it as small as possible so that is where your epsilon comes in so uh, so uh, usually we use epsilon for the values of the function and we use delta for the values of the variable so let me use delta so the point is that you are putting uh, you, are, you are choosing deltas as small as you want and you are letting mod z minus z not less than delta. Okay, so let me write that down, uh, which in turn means means uh, uh, let 
delta b small uh, consider mod z minus z naught less than delta and let delta tend to 0. This is what it means. You are uh, making uh, something small uh, uh, means you are actually uh, taking values of that uh, which are getting closer and closer to 0. Okay. And, uh, and you know uh, therefore you know the uh, of course all this conveys very clearly what is happening topologically uh, mod z minus z naught uh, less than delta is actually a disc it is an open disc centered at z naught radius delta. So, you are it means that you are going to uh, uh, infinitesimally small very very small neighborhood of z naught uh, and the smaller the delta is the smaller is the neighborhood is okay. So, so, so you are basically looking at you are just concentrating attention at a very small neighborhood of z naught that is what it means okay and uh, now you know in the uh, uh, in the same way you can so th now this uh, 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 this can be used uh, uh, to also define what limit is uh, it tends to infinity means okay so uh, so so limit z tends to infinity what do we make of this what do you make of limit z tends to infinity okay so now this is the uh, this is the point where you will have to have a little bit of imagination okay so the idea is that first of all you should be able to think of infinity as a point okay uh, as a concrete point and the second thing is that once you think of it as a concrete point in a space then you can think of uh, limit z going to infinity just uh, as you thought of z limit as z going to z naught you know uh, limit as z going to z naught meant that you were going to a small neighborhood of z naught. Now if you can think of infinity as a point in the same way limit z tends to infinity means that you are going to a small neighborhood of infinity okay. So all you need is a way of thinking of the point of infinity as a point on a space where you can think of a small neighborhood around that point okay. And the key to this is as you would have seen in a first course in complex analysis the key to this is the so called Riemann stereographic projection okay. So let me explain uh, that uh, so this is so let me write this down as uh, 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 go to uh, a small neighborhood neighborhood of infinity. Now what does that mean? What does that mean? So the key is uh, uh, the Riemann stereographic projection. That is the key. So, so let me recall what that is. So basically, uh, so the idea is uh, you should have seen this. Um, so what you do is the following: you you so let me draw a diagram. So here is uh, well, uh, 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 this is the uh, this is a three-dimensional space. So this is uh, uh, my uh, uh, well. Okay, so let me draw it like this. So this is my uh, usual x-y plane. This is the origin. Okay, and uh, this is the this is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. Okay, uh, or rather, this is a, if you want to be right handed then that is the y axis is the negative y axis right. Uh, so, uh, so if you want uh, the point 1 is here uh, point 1 on the y axis is here. Uh, uh, so, this point is 1 comma uh, 0 this point is 0 comma 1. So, uh, if you think of this uh, x y plane uh, uh, as usual uh, complex plane then you have two coordinates x and y and uh, of course uh, 1 comma 0 is the point 1 complex number 1 0 comma 1 is the complex number i okay but i the point is i want to put in a third axis uh, which normally in three dimensions you would call the z axis but you don't want to use z because z is already supposed to be express i y so you use let's use something else for it you use u if you want uh, some books use u let me also use it. So uh, what you do is now you take the three dimensional space now it is not x y z but it is x y u 
this is a positive u axis then what you do is that you draw this uh, uh, you draw this circle uh, I mean you draw this sphere centered at the origin and radius 1 okay. So, uh, so let me let me rub these uh, coordinates off because that will make me e make things easier for me to draw. So, you know I, I draw this uh, 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 so I have this uh, I have this circle uh, this is the unit circle on the complex plane and then I have this point uh, uh, 1 uh, uh, with, with u coordinate 1 okay uh, and x and y coordinate 0 okay. Uh, uh, so, it will be the north pole of uh, a sphere of the sphere centered at the origin and radius 1. So, what I am going to get is I am going to get something oops. Um, so, I am going to get uh, something like this. So here is my sphere. So this is uh, uh, this sphere is uh, this is a sphere. It's called the Riemann sphere. Uh, it's a sphere centered at the origin, radius one unit, and this point here, uh, which has coordinates uh, zero comma zero comma one for x, y, and u, it's called the North Pole. So I'll use the word. I, I'll 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 put the symbol n, okay. And of course, you know, if you um, project it all the way down, you are going to get the point. With, co with coordinate 0, 0, 0, minus 1 which is the south pole so called south pole okay. Uh, you can think of the earth as a sphere and you have the north pole and the south pole it is just like that. And uh, 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 so, so what is the stereographic projection? So what it does is that so let me call this sphere let me give you a name for the sphere. So let me call this as I uh, will put this S uh, uh, like a dollar symbol and put S2 and I will put a subscript R. So, this is the uh, this is standard topological notation okay. Uh, the 2 on top uh, S is supposed to denote, denote a sphere okay. The 2 on top is supposed to denote the dimension okay. It is the surface of a sphere okay. Mind you I am not taking the solid sphere I am taking only the surface of the sphere which is the surface okay. So, it is 2 dimensional and uh, by dimension I mean real dimension. So, it is real 2 dimensional okay. Uh, and the subscript R is to remind you that this is being done in real space okay, this is being done in real space, real 3 space. So, the, uh, the ambient space here is uh, R3, uh, oops. Uh, so, the ambient space here is R3, it is in 3 space, the only thing is that I am treating the x, y plane as the complex plane. and instead of the usual z axis I am calling it the u axis because z is already reserved for x plus i y okay. Now what you do is well this is a stereographic projection it is a very very simple projection what it does is that it it goes from the sphere uh, uh, I will call the sphere the Riemann sphere okay. Uh, so uh, it is called the Riemann sphere okay. Uh, it goes from the Riemann sphere minus the north pole to the complex plane uh, uh, to the complex plane okay and what is the map? So, what you do is you take any point on the uh, on the sphere okay mind you you are taking a point on the surface of the sphere okay and you are not taking the point at infinity uh, I mean you are not taking the point n okay you are not taking the point n. So, uh, uh, so, uh, as I just said in ad, in ad, inadvertently the point n will uh, be the missing point at infinity okay. So, that is the that will be the analogy okay. So, uh, we will see that. So, you take any point p here on the sphere uh, other than the north pole and then what you do is you join this you take the straight line passing through n and in p okay that straight line will go down and hit the plane at some point and that point will give you a complex number because for me any point on the plane is a complex number I have thought of the x y plane as a complex plane and that is the complex number to which I am going to send p to okay and you can see clearly it is a projection map okay it is a projection map and that is why it is called the stereographic projection okay. So, so basically what I do is I take this line uh, uh, from n uh, passing uh, through p and then it will go and hit the uh, uh, let me call this as phi of p. So, this is the map phi 
which sends p to phi of p and phi of p is a complex number phi of p is a complex number and uh, this is a stereographic projection. So, you have uh, if you want to think of it as a projection uh, uh, it is like this ok. Now, now the now the beautiful thing is that uh, uh, so uh, the beautiful thing is that this map phi is actually a bijective map ok. You can very well see that if uh, uh, p changes then phi p will change. So, it is an injective map ok and conversely give me any point on the complex plane it is of the form phi p for a unique point on this on the Riemann sphere because I can get that point by simply joining that point to the north pole that will hit the sphere at a certain point and that will be the point which will be mapped to the given point under phi ok. So, it is very clear that this map is bijective ok it is very clear that this map is bijective and uh, uh, in fact uh, you can try it out as an exercise uh, this map is actually a homeomorphism it is a topological isomorphism. See the the complex plane has a topology ok and uh, this topology is also this topology that uh, it is the same as the topology that the plane inherits as a subspace of uh, three dimensional space ok. You take the x y plane take the complex plane x y plane and treat it as a uh, plane in three space and you take the natural topology on R 3 you restrict that topology to this subset that is the same as it subs the topology on the complex plane ok. So, uh, the topology on the complex plane is the same as the topology uh, that it inherits as a subspace from 3 space and the sphere is also living in 3 space. So, it is also a subset of the 3 space. So, it also has uh, inherits the topology ok and the fact is that this map from the sphere to the plane uh, is uh, uh, in fact a continuous bijective map which is open and therefore uh, you know its inverse is also continuous. So, it is a homeomorphism it is a topological isomorphism it is a map which is continuous whose inverse is also continuous ok. Uh, of course, in the inverse being defined because the map is bijective ok. Uh, so, the beautiful thing is that phi is actually a homeomorphism ok. So, the fact that phi is a homeomorphism so, so let me write that down. Uh, 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 but, but, but before that let me tell you something uh, the fact that phi is a homeomorphism tells you that therefore, you can think of the whole complex plane as a punctured sphere ok. See uh, S 2 minus n is a punctured sphere it is a sphere minus the north pole ok and what this homeomorphism tells you what does a homeomorphism tell you it tells you that two spaces are topologically the same the same means up to isomorphism. So, when you say phi is an isomorphism topological isomorphism namely homeomorphism you are actually saying that you can this is just another way of saying that uh, the complex plane can be thought of topologically as a punctured sphere ok that is the significance uh, of this statement ok. So, let me write that down uh, uh, so here uh, let me take another color uh, phi is check uh, so, this check is something that uh, is more or less obvious, but you should do it phi is a homeomorphism ok. I uh, am um, certain many of you would have done this in a first course in complex analysis, but it is not very difficult to do if you have not done, done it. Um, so, phi is a homeomorphism uh, which tells you that the complex plane can be thought of as a punctured sphere ok. Now, the punctured sphere uh, misses only one point namely the north pole and now you know you have uh, uh, you uh, you wanted a point at infinity you wanted to attach to the complex plane a point at infinity, but the point is where do you attach it I mean you cannot see it ok. But then if you look at this picture you think of the complex plane like a punctured sphere now what is the extra point that you will have to add to make it the whole sphere and mind you when you make it the whole sphere only then it becomes compact ok. If if you remove uh, a point from a sphere it loses compactness ok because it will not be closed since we are in our uh, in Euclidean space a subset is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded. So, uh, the sphere is of course uh, any subset of the sphere is of course bounded, but the problem is that unless it is closed it is not compact. So, the only way uh, to make it compact is to add that missing point uh, that which in this case which is the north pole 
okay. So here comes the uh, here comes the nice upshot of this what you do is you think of uh, uh, the complex plane uh, plus the point at infinity you denote the point at infinity as uh, with the symbol of infinity and think of it as an extra point that you add to the set of complex numbers and then what is the topology you give? You give the topology which makes uh, the natural extension of this homeomorphism phi into a homeomorphism from the sphere to the extended complex plane which is a complex plane with that extra point it at infinity added okay. So, uh, 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 so define uh, 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 phi from the Riemann sphere to C union infinity. Uh, uh, by sending uh, n to the point at infinity okay. So, the north pole maps to the point at infinity and once you do this what you have done is you have given a bijection between the sphere and C union infinity. Mind you C union infinity will be called the extended complex plane, it is a complex plane plus the point at infinity. And uh, therefore, the complex plane plus the point at infinity is now nicely identified as a sphere. Okay, and the uh, the the advantage now is that you have therefore the point at infinity uh, being thought of as a north pole on the sphere, and it is a point on a topological space. So you can do topology in a neighborhood of the north pole, and think of it as doing uh, uh, as working uh, in a neighborhood of infinity. Okay, that's how you think of infinity. The point at infinity. Okay, so um, so I'll stop here.